Okay, we back in the Bronx, well at least for the most part. The name may not ring a bell, but in the 70s and among law enforcement officials, the five Boldens have attained legendary status. They had become, in effect, the first family of crime. By 1979, three Bolden brothers, sons of a Baptist minister in the Bronx, were behind bars, either awaiting trial or convicted of crimes. A fourth brother had recently been released from prison. And the Bolden sister had an arrest record. By 79, ranging in age from 17 to 21, the Bolden brothers have been arrested about 125 times. But that's only the tip of the iceberg. Detectives from the Bronx Senior Citizen Robbery Unit presume that for every arrest, the brothers have committed 10 to 50 other crimes, making them responsible in cops' eyes for anywhere from 1,200 to 6,000 crimes. While the Boldens had gained notoriety among police, prosecutors and court officials, because of the number and nature of their crimes, their story is more than just a crime saga. It is also the story of the disintegration of a family and the failure of the criminal justice system to recognize and deal with that breakdown. That was just an overview. Before we start, we wanted to clear things up. In our recent video about the Timmons twins, we had this picture as Henry Bolden. In fact this is Henry Bolden's brother, Ernest. This is actually Henry Bolden, aka, Ron Dew. Just wanted to clear that up. But we are not going to waste any more time, let's get into the story now. One of the earlier documented crimes was committed by none other than Henry Bolden. His criminal activity dated back to the 60s. In fact, in 1966, him and another dude, Ellington, were charged with burglary. A detective passing by 43rd and 6th Avenue in Mount Vernon said he saw the two young men remove six cartons containing a movie projector in each from a parked truck. They then loaded them onto a hand truck and started to leave. The detective however, seized them after a short distance. They were allowed to plead not guilty to reduce charges of petty larceny and unlawful entry. Ellington and Ron Dew were held in $500 and $1,000 bail respectively. Obviously, he would soon be released. Ops and detectives said the Boldens turned to crime because of peer pressure in the slum neighborhoods where they grew up. Education is not important, said one detective. Impressing your girlfriend is important. Wearing fine threads is important. Getting revenge against Whitey is important. Court officials believed the Boldens were products of a broken home, in which the parents never fully accepted responsibility for their children's actions. These kids had a strike against them when they were born, said one official familiar with the case. The second strike was when they set foot in school. Even in kindergarten, somebody should have recognized the problems. But they didn't. The system had absolutely guaranteed that the Boldens would not make it. The Boldens' mother, Margaret, was divorced in 1971 and had been receiving public assistance. The divorce was initiated by their father, the Reverend Henry Bolden, the pastor of a Baptist church in the Bronx. Their father drived a 1977 Cadillac, according to the Department of Motor Vehicles. I feel that the precinct is picking on my kids, making a lot of allegations, the Reverend Bolden said in a telephone interview. I've run into court so many times. Every time you turn around, the police grab the kids. This whole thing is a frame-up. It's ruining our name. Bolden acknowledged that he did not know for certain whether his sons were in jail or out. I'm a minister, he said. My sons are my sons. No father can say whether his sons are bad or good. These boys are my flesh and blood. Asked to identify his church, Bolden said, I've never been in trouble. I'm not giving you any more information. Don't put my name in the paper. The fact of the matter is, we shouldn't even be talking about this. He then hung up. Bolden's father was the founder and pastor of the Greater Eternal Baptist Church, at 290 East 151st Street near Morris Avenue, a one-story building with a peaked roof that sat next to an annex of Hostos College. It was learned, however, that because of the children's numerous encounters with the law, the family had often been referred by the courts for counseling or remedial services. The results were disastrous. In 1972, after the parents separated, the family was sent to Salvation Army Family Services. The children refused to go. In 1973, they were referred to the East Tremont Crisis Center. The three Bolden boys, Henry, Ernie and Robert refused to go. All ran away. In 1974, Henry, Ernie and Robert were sent to a residential facility, the Harlem Confrontation Center. All three ran away. They also ran away from Inwood House, another residential facility. 
Classified by the Board of Education as handicapped and emotionally disturbed, Robert was placed at the Bronx State Hospital Children's Psychiatric School. He failed to attend. Between 1974 and 1976, there were constant referrals to schools and counseling services. All met with lack of cooperation. After a while, Mrs. Bolden failed to appear in court. Court officials say that virtually every counselor, psychiatrist and social worker who came in contact with the family reached the same conclusion. The children should be removed from the mother and placed elsewhere. They never were. Meanwhile, as the Boldens moved from one address to another, the brothers continued to run afoul of the law. Wherever the Boldens stayed, says one detective, crime appeared to flourish. In dealing with people who have a long history of viciousness and violence, and when they are apprehended and the evidence is strong, judges should either set higher bail or have some kind of mechanism to keep them off the streets, said a pair of detectives of the Bronx Senior Citizen Robbery Unit. The same people are committing these crimes time and time again. In the late 1960s and early 1970s, the family resided at 1420 Washington Avenue, one of 13 red brick high-rises in the Claremont housing development, which tower over the southeast Bronx. Of three of the families which resided at 1420, eight youngsters have been arrested 200 times, including three times for murder. Among the more infamous residents of 1420 were the Timmons twins, Ronald and Raymond, who have been dubbed the grandfathers of the push-in robbery. The push-in is a technique favored by muggers who prey on elderly persons inside their apartment buildings. Curtis Bolden is believed to have committed some of his crimes with the Timmons twins. And then of course, Henry Bolden and Ronald Timmons would participate in the well-documented AZ robbery. In the late 70s and 80s though, the Boldens would make the newspapers for the havoc they were causing. In 1977, when Henry was about 17, 18 years old, he was convicted of robbing an 84-year-old man and his 74-year-old wife at knife point. While an accomplice held the knife to the woman's throat, Henry was said to have ripped the old man's teeth from his mouth. On the day he was sentenced, Henry entered the Bronx courtroom laughing. His friends sat in the rear of the court. They laughed too. Before being sent to prison, Henry had been arrested more than a dozen times on such charges as burglary, robbery, possession of stolen property, assault, attempted murder and possession of drugs. His arrest in 1974 for robbing, assaulting and attempting to kill an 80-year-old black woman was the first arrest made by the newly formed Senior Citizens Robbery Unit. He served two months in prison for that crime. For the assault on the old man and his wife, he was sentenced to serve an 8 to 25 years at the Eastern State Correctional Facility in Ulster County. He would be out the game until the mid-80s. Meanwhile, his brothers were getting into trouble. Curtis Bolden was the oldest brother. 1980, he was sentenced to a minimum 15-year prison term with a recommendation that he never be paroled. He was indicted in the rapes of three elderly women in the Fordham Road Jerome Avenue section of the Bronx and was a suspect in the rapes of seven others. He was being held on $225,000 bail at the House of Detention for Men on Rikers Island. A detective of the Bronx X crime squad said the victims ranged in age from 55 to 85. One, an 82-year-old woman, used a walker. Another, 80, relied on a cane. One victim remained so frightened after the rape that she insisted on sleeping upright in a chair for seven straight months. Two women remained under psychiatric care. He was accused of beating, raping, and robbing the 55-year-old woman of $100 and of taking $41 in food stamps from the 73-year-old widow after putting her through the same assault. Bolden shoved the widow into a closet and put a heavy dresser in front of the door so that it took time for her to get out and call police. Detectives found a fingerprint of a left index finger on the closet door, and that led to Curtis's arrest. Both crimes were push-in attacks, in which Bolden followed the women home and pushed them into their apartments when they opened their doors. Police believed that Bolden had a partner in some of his early attacks, but that the second man dubbed him, apparently because he objected to the sexual attacks. Before the assaults, Curtis had been arrested at least 20 times. He spent two years in state prison on a robbery conviction. He had been charged at other times with assault, resisting arrest, burglary, attempted rape, robbery, grand larceny and reckless endangerment. At the time, he had an address at 2150 Creston Avenue in the Bronx. Ernest Bolden was the second youngest brother. Sometime before around June of 1979, Ernest had recently completed a 90-day sentence on Rikers Island, following his conviction on charges of criminal mischief and possession of a controlled substance. 
He already had served sentences ranging from 15 to 90 days for pickpocketing, possession of stolen property, accosting, petty larceny, possession faux drugs, criminal mischief, gambling and loitering. 17-year-old awaiting trial before turning 16, he had been arrested at least 23 times for juvenile delinquency. Since then, he was arrested 16 times in an 18-month period. Police said he used hard drugs. Short-term prison sentences had little effect on the Bolden brothers. When told that he was being sent to jail after one of his arrests, Ernest Bolden reportedly complained to one court officials that a weekend in prison would cost him $2,000 to $3,000 in pickpocketing proceeds. Not too long after he was released from his 90-day sentence on Rikers Island, he would be involved in a crime. The incident took place at 2.40 a.m. on July 23, 1979. Raymond Dewan, 22, a lieutenant in the National Guard, was at Washington Avenue and Claremont Parkway, visiting his old neighborhood, when he was chased by a half-dozen persons and robbed of $60. Dewan flagged down a police car and, while touring the neighborhood, spotted two of his attackers, Ernest Bolden, and another youth. Police arrested the pair. Ernest was sentenced to six years in prison after pleading guilty to charges of robbery, assault and criminal possession of a weapon. Even their sister Lucille was with the antics as well. She had been arrested in March 1977 on assault charges stemming from a fistfight near a schoolyard, police say. Then you had Robert Bolden. Robert Bolden was the baby brother. Before turning 16, Robert had piled up a record of 18 arrests. Charges included robbery, grand larceny, jostling, possession of stolen property, reckless endangerment, burglary, trespassing and transmitting a false alarm. After turning 16, he was arrested six more times. After all of this, Henry Bolden pops up in the news headlines again. This time, it was for the situation with Ronald Timmons and the robbery of AZ. Three people were killed, three people survived, in what was a botched robbery. We covered this in this video, but we will go a little bit more in depth about the captures and other small details, if you care to stick around. Go to the timestamp on the screen to skip to the move along part. So, the year is 87, Henry Bolden's cousin, Isaac, who went by the name, Just Me, was also in Jamaica, Queens. He had served a prison term, and allegedly, Fat Cat, who had a powerful drug organization in Queens, had put Just Me back on his feet. He was rubbing shoulders with Supreme Team members, as you see him in this picture with Gerald Prince Miller, Supreme Kenneth McGriff's nephew. They were all allies. Sometime that year, in 87, Fat Cat suspected two men, just me and his cousin, Henry Bolden, of robbing him. Henry Bolden also went by the name Ron Dew. While Nichols was incarcerated, he sought Prince Miller's assistance in locating the Boldens, so that Nichols's crew members could kill them. Long story short, they got the drop on Henry Bolden's address in the Bronx, where thereafter, he was shot. Henry Bolden survived the shooting though. Fat Cat and the Supreme Team also got Just Me's mother's address, 15066-116th Avenue. About August 7, 1987, while Just Me was standing in front of his brown Cadillac at around 4.45 p.m., gunmen drove up and began shooting. Just Me was struck by at least four bullets. He was taken to Jamaica Hospital, where he died. Henry Bolden, who was going by the name Ron Dew, would still engage in crime after his cousin's death, and committed one of his most heinous crimes two weeks later. AZ was a drug dealer from Harlem. After attending a screening of the 1983 film Scarface, AZ was influenced to enter the drug trade, and later that year, established a working relationship with a local Dominican supplier, who would frequently go to the dry cleaners where he worked. By the time he turned 21, AZ would transition into becoming the cocaine wholesaler in Harlem, reportedly earning $40,000 a week or more. He had a crew, known and unknown. Location, 132, which was 132nd Street on the west side. Rich Porter, Alpo, Whip Wop, Pretty Tone Capone, and Gangster Lou are the most known guys. Gangster Lou would introduce AZ to guys in Queens, such as Prince. You can see that black Juss, who was getting money with Prince, Supreme and the Supreme team, in pictures with these Harlem guys. It was known that AZ was getting money, and he'd soon be set up. Two weeks after Just Me was killed for robbing Fat Cat with Ron Dew, in the early morning hours of August 21, 1987, AZ was the victim of attempted murder, after a robbery went awry at his aunt's house. 
The place served as one of his stash houses and was located at 1295 Grand Concourse in the Bronx. The botched robbery left three people dead and three others seriously injured. It was about 1.30 in the morning when I heard them coming in, a neighbor said. There were seven of them in the car, and it looked like they had been partying at a bar. Those women were always partying. The women entered the building and walked up to the third floor apartment. The driver stayed behind. 20 minutes or so later, the guy in the car starts yelling one of the females name, Anna, Anna, let's go. He went upstairs and found them in the bedroom. The six victims were handcuffed, put on the floor, robbed, beaten and shot several times. Okay so, the first person to go down in the situation was Kevin Clark. In late August of 1987, Kevin Clark, 27 at the time, and was residing on Woody Crest Avenue in Highbridge in the Bronx, walked into the station house on Walnut Street in Harrisburg at 10.30 p.m. It was a Sunday evening. He told police, I understand you're looking for me, authorities said. Two Bronx detectives were already there. Police said the two drew up an arrest warrant charging Clark with murder in the bloodbath. Police said Clark fled the Bronx with his wife and their children. Investigators said one of the victims identified Clark, and police searched for him in the Harrisburg area because he has in-laws and other relatives there. He stayed in several places, moving between one place and another, said the deputy detective. Clark's arrest record dated back to at least 1976 and includes guilty pleas to assault and gun possession charges, according to state files. Clark served time on both convictions and was on parole on the gun charge at the time of the shooting. Clark's next-door neighbor described him as a quiet, very nice man who doesn't look the kind to have been involved in such crimes. Police said Clark and his wife had four children. Shortly after Kevin Clark was arrested, Ronald Timmons would be arrested at his parole office and booked on murder charges for the Bronx shootings. On September 19, almost a month after Kevin and Ronald was arrested, Henry Bolden was arrested. Police wanted to question the 28-year-old Bolden, but didn't immediately categorize him as a suspect. Eventually, he was grabbed at 12.30 a.m. in Richmond, Virginia by detectives from the Sedgwick Avenue station in the Bronx. They had been trailing him since the killings. I heard a young girl yelling back at them, she was standing her ground, and they pistol whipped her, testified the 34-year-old man, Mike. Mike was a postal worker. The 13-year-old recounted that feistiness in her own testimony. Someone said, leave her alone, she's only 12, and I said, I'm not 12, I'm 13. She showed maturity beyond her years, however, when one of the female victims cried, we're going to die, the young girl, lying next to her, whispered, we are not going to die, just have faith we are not going to die. The woman didn't survive though. The young girl was shot twice in head. In all, a 23-year-old man died, and two women died, 44 years old and 50 years old. Mike was shot multiple times, and AZ was shot a total seven to nine times in the robbery attempt. To make a long story short, the perps would get sentenced to 112 years in prison. Those involved were Kevin from Highbridge, Henry Bolden, who had an address near Forest Projects in the Bronx and was known as Ron Dew, and Ronald Timmons, the twin who was known as Ace. According to a news article, AZ would be the star witness and said that he felt like he was floating when he was shot in the head by Ace. Then I heard a lot of shots, and I kept saying to myself, let me fall, let me fall. He left the witness stand at one point to show the jury where he was shot. The young girl and the 34-year-old, Mike, testified against Ace as well, but AZ would go a step further, identifying Ron Dew and Kevin as the other two shooters. AZ said he knew Kevin because Kevin used to deal with AZ's sister. Kevin's attorney tried to shake AZ's credibility by questioning him at length about his involvement in drugs. AZ said he was a dealer at the time of the incident, but not any long, and that he was cutting a rap record. This would be the start of mob style. AZ was 24 when he got shot up. Do you see the man in the courtroom, the prosecutor asked. Ronald Timmons seemed to shrink in his red shirt. That's him there. Said the witness Mike. Ronald Timmons shot me in the back. He brought a hand to his face and actually made a whimpering sound. He just shot me, bang, then said, shut up. I had never heard a gun before, Mike said. Years after the shooting, the memory, like the damage from five bullets, is permanent. It is very hard to look at him, Mike continued. The face is always in my mind. Please don't make me do that. Henry Bolden had his last say in Bronx courtroom before he was sentenced to 112 years to life. 
He and Timon said Mike, the young girl and confessed drug dealer, AZ, lied on the witness stand. These are not good people, they're not the best people, Bolden said. I feel just like the victims in this case. I feel like everybody got railroaded. There's a lot of cover-up going on here. The triple murderer triggered an angry shouting match at the sentencing, as Ace challenged one of the survivors of his massacre to look him in the eye. Why don't you look at me now? You never look at me, Ace shouted at Mike. I wasn't the man that did this to you. Yes, you did. Yes you did, Mike yelled back, just minutes before the judge socked Timmons with 112 years to life in prison. You were there. I hope you catch AIDS and die, Ace snapped back. The Boldens wouldn't be in the paper for anything significant, except for in 2015, it when Curtis Bolden, as a registered sex offender, was staying at a shelter for families in the Bronx. Local leaders were on edge. Curtis Bolden, 57, told authorities his primary residence was the shelter in the former Capri Whitestone Motel in Ferry Point, state records showed. Members of Community Board 10 appealed to the city hoping to boot the ex-con, saying they were told the site, which opened in September, would be a shelter for families. I believe it's inappropriate to have a convicted rapist staying there, said the board's district manager. Remember, Bolden was convicted of sexually assaulting two women, ages 55 and 71 at knife point in 1978. He was discharged from prison in 2010. A Department of Homeless Services spokesman said he was prohibited from speaking about an individual client, adding, DHS makes every effort to ensure the safety of its clients and families. Not sure how that turned out. But this about wraps this story up, and as always, stay low and thanks for watching.